Welcome. My name is Steve Gauck. I'm the Regional Agronomy Manager for the Eastern Region for Bex Hybrids. And today I want to talk a little bit about weed management solutions for soybeans. And really what we're going to focus on is the program and the process to control weeds. And what I really want you to come away with today is understanding that pre-emerge herbicides, residuals are very important, and that post-treatments are, are more of looking at a rescue and, or keep them as part of your program for the season. And why is that? Well, we know that history kind of repeats itself. A lot of our post-herbicides and soybeans, we have resistant weeds now. So how do we combat that? How do we not select for those resistant biotypes? Well, one is we got to start looking at this and take no prisoners. We want no escapes in our weed control program. The other way we're going to do that is through taking pressure off our current sites of action herbicides. So one is through the power and the pre, pre-emerge residual herbicides. The next, use overlapping residual herbicides in our post application. Because ultimately, the best weed control is the weed that never emerged. So we're going to talk about weed control systems. Now notice I don't say herbicides, I say weed control systems, because there is a system to have excellent weed control. For a lot of us, that system starts with tillage. And can tillage actually impact my weed spectrum? Well, if we think about history and over time, years ago we fought different weed spectrums 10, 15, 20 years ago than we do today. Well, part of that had to do with tillage. So we think about deep tillage, moldboard plow, we're burying those weed seeds, so our small seeded broadleaves, our, our ones with a thinner seed coat, don't survive as well. But our large seeded broadleaves, such as a giant ragweed, cockleburr, things like that, will come through more in a moldboard situation. Now, vertical tillage actually promotes seed to soil contact. That's what that tool does. It does a great job of working that top inch of the soil, possibly warming it, and it creates really good seed to soil contact. Well, it does that for weeds also, and you can see that in our pictures here. We start down there in the bottom with the moldboard, not much weed, weed pressure. We jump to the vertical till up in the top right corner in the fall, followed by vertical till in the spring, and look at the weed pressures. So we actually are seeding those weeds. So if you're using a vertical till system, you have to be conscious of that and make plans in your herbicide program to help. Yes, we get better plant emergence from our corn and soybeans, but we're seeding those weed seeds. Now, no-till, as you'll see in the top left corner there, mare's tail and kosh actually thrive in those situations. So again, as we think about our tillage operations, we must base our herbicide programs on that. Now, here's another way to look at it, and this is part of our PFR research. So we're doing herbicide treatment programs at our PFR farms now, and I want to thank Joe Bolte and his herbicide specialist team for putting a lot of this stuff together that you guys see. They're doing an awesome job and really giving us some neat data to look at. Well, here's a picture of, of a field that we have that you'll see the moldboard plow where they've plowed through here. It's very clean, right? We buried a lot of those weed seeds, and a lot of what we're fighting there at that farm is small seeded broadleaf, so it worked pretty good. If you look here in our chisel and our vertical till in line, you see some green there. That's a heavier weed pressure. Now what you're seeing across here is modes of action. So where we have three modes of action, if you look across all the tillage practices, it's pretty clean, pretty impressive. But when you look at one mode of action or one side of action herbicide, we've got some breaks, especially in that vertical till inline chisel type situation. So again, we gotta think about what is our tillage program and that helps us set our herbicides. The key, multiple modes of action. Now here's another way to kind of look at that picture of, a, of the weed pressure. You'll see the no-till in, in a plants per square foot, 28 days after a herbicide application, we've got 62 water hemp emerge versus only 28 in the moldboard plow. Makes sense, right? But if we only use one side of action herbicide, we've got 54 in no-till, 37 in the vertical till, and only one in the moldboard. So again, only one mode of action, not enough to control it. We jump to three, those numbers become a lot more manageable with three sites of action. Now, the next step in a weed control system is actually canopy closure and row width. So, canopy closure is the best herbicide on the market. Shade is some of our best, best weed control. 
And you'll see in our 30 inch row here, untreated, we got some escapes. Even the 15 inch row, untreated, we have escapes. So, weed control's not the only, or canopy closure's not the only answer. There's other things we gotta look at. And one is pre emerge residual herbicides. But in our PFR studies, you'll notice that one mode of action, one side of action herbicide, almost always broke before that canopy closed. That has got to be your new goal in weed control and soybeans is how do I keep it weed free until I get to that canopy closure? So here's some more pictures you'll look at. In, our, in the top left, you'll see 30 inch rows, one side of action. We've got some weeds poking through. And in the past, we'd go, well, we'll just go clean that up 10, 15 years ago, right? We'd go in there with a glyphosate, spray that. Can't do that today. Too many resistant weeds. And that's how we came up with all these resistant weeds. We look down at the bottom left, 30 inch rows with three sites of action. It's a lot cleaner, isn't it? 15 inch rows, same situation. Hard to see in this picture, but one site of action, we've got breaks coming. With three, we don't. There's a value in spending some money up front to keep these weeds under control. Now another practice that we look at is cover crops. A lot of people have been using cover crops. They're trying to reduce their weed seed pressure from that. And we're seeing some of that even in our PFR research. Water hemp plants per square foot. We've got cover crops out there. When we go out there with just Roundup and yeah, we're knocking them back. Even 21 days after application, we're lowering those numbers. But when we add a residual, to that burn down program for cover crops, we greatly reduce the number of water hemp that come through. So even if you're using cover crops to limit your weed seed, your weed pressure, residuals are still key to success. Now I'm going to jump into some burn down options because we're getting more and more with the new soybean technologies. And ultimately here, as we talk about burn down and, and we talk about the programs the rest of the way through, I'm not all that concerned about what your soybean technology trait is. We've got new options and burn down from that aspect, but ultimately the pre, the residuals are what's key to all the systems. So let's look at mare's tail burn down. Now this is 21 days after treatment. So if we look across here, there's some pretty good numbers, pretty impressive. And the ones that jump out to you is the 100%, because that's what we're all after at the end of the day. But 100%, all those contain Sharpen. Now Sharpen's a PPO. It's very good in terms of mare's tail control. A little bit of residual you'll get out of that product, but it's got some limited uses in terms of soil types, pHs, and even in some areas, plant backs. So it doesn't work for everybody, but it is a strong product. You'll see as we come across, you'll look at burn down. We've looked at it in list one. We've looked at it with Roundup, we've looked at it with Liberty, we've looked at it in combinations. And then we get over here to the right, you'll see the Ingenia, the Dicamba products with Roundup, and with Sharpen. Now what I really want to point out here that I think is interesting is you don't see anything by itself. We're combining multiple modes of action except for the one Liberty program, right? But Liberty's almost too expensive to use in a burn down. So we're combining them. Here you'll see the Dicamba, Roundup Power Max at 91% control. And why I point that out is we don't think a lot of using dicamba type products in our burn down. Mainly because in the past we've waited 14 days, there's plant back restrictions, so it hasn't been a popular product. Now it's a new option we can, look, we can take a look at. It has great control. If you jump over to the left side, you'll see the Enlist One with the Roundup Power Max. The reason I point this out at only 73% is this has been a more common practice. We've used 2,4-D in our burn down with Roundup, waited our set plant back time, and then planted. Well, now we get the option with Enlist 1, we can spray, go right into it. But why the big difference between the Dicamba and the 2,4-D? A couple things. One is Dicamba is a little bit stronger when temperatures are cooler. So in an Extend Flex soybean system where you can spray an Ingenia type product, plant into it, we don't have any plant backs, works better in the cold. The other thing that we look at too is a mare's tail has a rosette, it's flat on the ground. And once it starts to stand up, we call that bolting. Once it starts to bolt, 2,4-D is not as strong on it as the dicamba type products. So both are great options. Both give you options and that's, that is what we want. But I want you to be aware of how they work and where their strengths and weaknesses are. So let's look into that a little deeper. 
Maresdale, Maresdale burned down control with dicamba. You'll see here we use clarity because we didn't plant beans into this. And it was in the summer where, where the dicamba label was, was um, still in, in limbo last year. So we're looking at clarity here over in list one. And you'll see our untreated heavy weed pressure. It was a fallow field last year. We let it grow up to have weed pressure for these studies. You'll see our clarity plus sharpen plus glyphosate, 21 days, very strong, very clean field, 21 days after application. Here we're looking at clarity and glyphosate, 21 days. And you know, we've got a few escapes from that standpoint. And we expect that, right? Only two modes of action versus three in the other one. But clarity and sharpen, very effective on, on glyphosate resistant mare's tail. So ultimately here, where we had glyphosate resistant mare's tail, the clarity was doing all the work. Now we can also look at it from an enlist one standpoint, sharpen and enlist one. So again, we have our untreated. We jump here and look at enlist one plus sharpen plus glyphosate. So we're looking at glyphosate resistant mare's tail. We got two modes of action with the enlist one and the sharpen. Here, just the straight sharpen and glyphosate. So both good programs. Enlist one mare's tail success, though, really will depend on the size and the density. So smaller the mare's tail are, the less density or population of mare's tail you have, the better that product will work. Now let's take a look here, comparing enlist one with glyphosate or enlist one with liberty. Again, we look at glyphosate resistant weeds. Our enlist one plus glyphosate there on the far left, 21 days after application, we've got some escapes. Glyphosate resistant mare's tail, we're counting on the enlist one to do all the work again. We jump here with enlist one and liberty, two modes of action, both very effective. We've got a clean field. We actually look here at water hemp. So this is an in season application because water hemp comes up later in the season. We're not gonna get that in our burn down program or control it as well because it's not up. But here where it's emerged, you'll see our pre-emerge herbicide followed by enlist one with glyphosate 28 days after application. We've got some escapes. Again, it goes back to these glyphosate resistant mares tail and enlist one trying to do all the work. Where we do the enlist one plus liberty, very clean. So now we're gonna take the next step into the power in the pre, the pre-merge herbicides. And you've heard the saying, right? The sins of planting will haunt you all season. Well, the sins of a poor herbicide program will also haunt you all season. So we've gotta start strong. We've gotta be able to, to put a little money in our pre-merge herbicides be prepared to, to use multiple modes of action and go after weeds, and here's why. We're comparing here the three different, three different fields with different sites of action. So we're adding as we go across. Over on the far left, you'll see one site of action pre, followed just by Roundup 28 days after application. The flags indicate weed escapes. We jump to the middle picture. Two modes of action, followed by glyphosate 28 days after better control. We get to the picture on the far right, three sites of action down early in our residual, excellent control. Our PFR data actually shows that going from one to two modes of action, we see a 29% increase in con weed control, and going from two to three, another 37%. That's substantial. That is substantial at the end of the day. So we're really focusing here on this picture on the right, using, using more of our resources up front never letting these weeds emerge, because we do not want that post application to become a rescue application. Then we're in trouble. How though, do we work into the system our post application and make sure it's not a rescue treatment? Well, one way is by using in-season residuals. Our pre-emerge herbicides, the lifespan of them normally breaks about 28 days after planting. That's when we start seeing weeds escape. So ultimately our goal then is to go in at 21 to 24 days after planting and spray again. Now that's, that's a change in mindset for a lot of us because here we're looking at these fields 28 days are not canopied yet. And a lot of us got in the mindset over the years of, well, I want to wait right till they canopy and then spray because I want to use the shade of that canopy to keep my weeds under control. Well, it's not working anymore. We're spraying big weeds. We started to get the resistance. So now we want to come back in here at this 21, 24 days using our post herbicide, but also adding a residual to it. So here's why. So we look over in the left picture, we've got one mode of action followed by Roundup. Again, you see the flags, you see the weed escapes. We're going to have to come back and respray that. 
Next, we see a, a one mode of action followed by one mode of action sprayed post. Now, the other big key to this, residual post, the warrant there, is spraying it well before canopy. These post residuals don't work if they're on the soybean. They have to be on the ground. They have to be on the dirt to do any good. Now, we jump here, and you look at one mode of action followed by two modes of action in our residual, layered residual. Excellent weed control from that standpoint. Now, again, there's a cost involved in that, but to have that kind of weed control to get us to canopy, another four weeks of protection is worth a lot. Well, let's take a look here at some more PFR data, uh, comparing our different pre-emerge herbicides. So you'll see one side of action, and you look at our visual control on the far left, 85% control on water hemp. Most of us aren't going to be very happy with that. We jump to two sites of action. Well, I'm at 90. I jump to three, I'm at 95. That's pretty impressive. And as I start layering in residuals, as I go to the right on this chart, I'm up here at 99% control. That's fantastic. That's what we want to get to. But some of you look at this and say, well, Steve, that's all fine and dandy, but you know, I'm 90 to 97% control there on the two sites of action. You know, what's 7%? Is that that big a deal? Well, somebody smarter than me did the math. So Joe Bolte and some of his crew said, all right, what's 6% weed control worth? They went through five water hemps per square meter. They did all the math. At the end of the day, it comes up to 17 million viable seeds per acre. It's what 6% better control can do for you. Okay, we're going to knock that many more seeds out. That's a lot of seeds. That is why we've got to start pushing towards these 99% control. Okay, we've got our residuals down. We're moving forward. We're looking at our post applications. We're going to add a residual to them, but we also need to maximize our post applications. New technologies in soybeans have brought us a lot of opportunities now to look at a lot of different things. But ultimately, at the end of the day, Liberty is going to be the building block for almost every technology package. So how do we make Liberty work as successful as possible? Well, in our PFR studies, we've done a lot of looking at different, different scenarios and different things. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of what we've learned. Number one, spray coverage is king. And as you look and listen to videos here throughout Bex, you're going to hear that with fungicides and other things too. But spray coverage is king. Take a look. Liberty at 10 gallon per acre, 73% control. We wouldn't be happy with that. We jump over here to 20 gallons up to 93. All we did was add more water. Why? Liberty is a contact killer. It must touch every part of that plant to kill every growing point that's in there. A mare's tail plant has a growing point at every leaf that comes out. There's a lot of growing points to cover. We need 20 gallons of water to get them all, to be happy with your control, gallons of water. Now, some of you say, well, I'm going to spray my Liberty and my glyphosate together because I've got a technology that allows me to do that. And Roundup doesn't need as much water. That is true. But look here, even the 10 gallons, 68% control. We're counting on that glyphosate to pick up glyphosate resistant weeds. It's not going to happen. We've got to stay with our high gallons of water, get good coverage, and even make the Roundup work better. Here's a kind of a nice visual comparing the weed pressures based on those spray gallons. So our untreated in the top left, we jump here to the Liberty at 10 gallons, 28 days. We're not happy with that. Jump down to the bottom, 15 gallons, a little better. We jump to 20, much better. We're cleaning those fields up. It seems simple just to up gallons. A lot of us don't want to haul that extra water and do all that work. But water's cheap in most areas. A lot of us are pulling out of the well. It does take more time. But to get this kind of weed control versus 20 gallon versus the 10 gallon picture, it's worth the time. Next, we want to look at weed size. So we talked about Liberty being a contact killer, and we've got to get coverage. Easiest way to get coverage, spray when that weed's small. We're going to target that four inch and under. So your pop can size, we want to be that or smaller. We see our six inch control. Yeah, we, we missed a few spots there. We get over here to 12 inches, uh, not quite as good. Now, Liberty will kill tall weeds, but you have got to soak them. So to soak them, let's target the small weeds. You'll be much happier with your control. Next thing to maximizing your Liberty application, let's take a look at nozzle types. So here's actually Liberty and glyphosate together. You see our spray cards. 
So the more purple you see is the more water that gets down into the canopy. So you'll see the 93% control, we're getting a lot of water down the canopy. The fan, the flat fan does a nice job of getting good coverage. Now some of you tell me though, hey Steve, I've been spraying Liberty a couple years and I'm not getting as good a control as I was a few years ago. What do you think happened? What I think happened is the nozzles are starting to wear out. They're plastic, they do wear out. So be conscious of that. If your weed control is starting to lack a little bit, take a look at your nozzles. So moving forward, here's another thing with Liberty to consider. Liberty works better in the heat of the day. You start looking at these two o'clock applications, 95, 99% control. At 6 a.m. we're at 74 and 82. The heat of the day is when we really get great weed control. And a lot of you say, well, I, you know, I can't just spray in the afternoons. I don't have time. I got too many acres to cover. And I understand that. So we, there's a window here you can kind of be in. But if you look through our PFR book and other practical farm research, you'll know that spraying fungicides and foliar feeds in the morning is much more profitable. So to be highly profitable on your farm, spray those in the morning. After lunch, go spray your weeds. I know it takes some clean out, but at the end of the day, it'll offer a great opportunity to maximize both programs. Here's another part of Liberty is AMS. So you jump over there to the left graph, you'll see Liberty plus Roundup with no AMS. I'm at 78% control of water hemp. But I add two to three pounds of AMS. Look at the jump. Pretty impressive. AMS is an important part of making Liberty work. So keys to Liberty success. Start with two or three effective sites of action in your pre-emerge herbicide. Ultimately, I'd love to see three at the end of the day. We want to make sure that field is clean. No weed ever emerges. Use an in-season residual with your Liberty, because Liberty doesn't have any residual value, just like glyphosate. Use 20 gallon of water. If you're not spraying in a combination with a list one, make sure you're using small droplets. Two to three pounds of AMS. Target for the heat of the day. And again, even if you add glyphosate, make sure weeds are small. Moving forward, we're going to talk about maximizing Enlist One. New opportunity for us to use Enlist One, the 2,4-D product on Enlist soybeans. But with every new product, there's strengths and there's weaknesses. So let's find out how to maximize that. So here we look at spray volume again. This is kind of a, a we keep repeating this theme over and over. Gallons of water. So Enlist One plus Liberty at 20 gallons, 95, 97% control. Pretty impressive. We jump over here on the right side, you see Enlist One with Liberty at 10 gallons per acre, 50 and 55. Really takes a hit. The other thing when you look at this chart is you notice you don't see Enlist One sprayed by itself. Enlist One, Enlist one is a great product, but it works even better when we combine it back to this multiple modes of action. That's what we're after. So even with Roundup at 15 gallons, Roundup, Liberty, List One at 15 gallons, we're not getting the control we get if we don't go to the 20 gallons there on the far left. So again, spray volume is a big part of making all your post herbicides work better. Now we're looking at the, the visual pictures here of the gallon spraying. The Enlist One, the glyphosate at 10 gallon per acre, there's some, there's some escapes. We jump over to Enlist One and Liberty at 10 gallons. We're, the Liberty's not helping us out. We've already solved that in this presentation that we need water to get those covered. We jump to 15 and we jump to 20, much better. We really need to target that 20 gallon of water. So what are some strengths between Enlist One plus Liberty and Enlist One plus glyphosate? Well, Enlist One plus Liberty is really good on water hemp, but it's pretty weak on grasses. We need to add glyphosate into that mix to get those grasses. So you'll see in that picture on the left, a lot of grass escapes. Enlist One plus glyphosate, 21 days after application, it's very good on grasses, but for the most part can be average on water hemp. And if our water hemp is glyphosate resistant, we're counting on the Enlist One to do all the work. And again, like we talked about in our heavy densities, that's not maybe its strength. So now we're looking at the system again. We're using residuals up front and using multiple modes of action. So two modes of action followed by Liberty on the left side, 94, 98%. As we come across here, we start looking at two modes of action. Enlist one, glyphosate, and adding warrant. In this situation, or adding a residual layered in, we start jumping those percentages up. 
We get down here, authority supreme, two modes of action, list one, liberty and warrant, fantastic weed control. There's a cost involved with doing that, but to be able to not have weeds competing for yield, help improve your harvestability, in a lot of cases it's definitely worth it. So here's another kind of study we did in PFR, just taking a look at heavy water, water hemp pressure, but not a lot of grass pressure. What should we do? So you see our untreated there. Here we've got Enlist 1 plus glyphosate, 35 days after application. Most likely what we missed there is a lot of those glyphosate resistant water hemp. Enlist 1 plus Liberty, 35 days after, pretty clean. We're getting two good modes of action going after all those water hemp. Here we have the straight Enlist 1 plus Colethidem. We've got some escapes. We counted on Enlist 1 to do all the work by itself. Again, it's a good product, but when we combine it with multiple modes of action on broadleaves, it's going to be a lot stronger. You're going to be much happier. So now we'll talk about a little bit about maximizing extend flex post applications. Okay? Really, ultimately, when I think about the keys to success on extend flex, it's going to be a lot in the pre-merge program. We talked about that in the burn down, how it works better in cooler weather. It actually can give us uh, maybe up to 14 days residual in a burn down program. So to still be, ex to still be successful with Extend Flex though, we've got to use powerful pre-merge herbicides. We can ultimately use it at planting for merge weeds and for that residual. We can take down some weeds in our burn down program. Nozzle selection is going to be key. Again, just like everything else we've talked about, we've got to target this post-emergence trip 21 to 24 days after planting. That's the window we, we start spraying by the calendar, not by the weed pressure. It's probably one of the strongest options from a burn down and a pre to add in, much stronger in cooler temperatures. Now here's some limitations though, it cannot be tank mixed with Liberty. So we're probably going to lean towards the Liberty as our post application, use the Use the dicamba type products in Genia Extended Max up front. There's no grass activity with it, and we can't put AMS with it. So we talked about, hey, AMS is very important to Liberty, so that's something we've got to watch. So we're not going to be able to tank mix them and no AMS to make sure we don't have any issues. So ultimately, what are the keys to success in your weed management program? One is the power in the pre. Multiple modes of action in that pre-residual herbicide. Use overlapping residuals. Apply a residual with your post application. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the best weed control is the one that never emerged. That, at the end of the day, is our goal. If we can keep them from emerging, you're going to be much more successful in terms of increasing yields and harvestability and be much happier during the season. I appreciate your time, and thank you.